When Abraham was old, oops, I, I dropped my pen. Oh, uh, what are you doing there, Festus? Uh, I, I'm singing along with a, 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 about a song here about Abraham. Then why can't I understand you? What did you have in your mouth? Well, because I don't want to lose my phantasmagorical pen here. Why don't you hold it and sing? Well, you know, I, I've got these little wiggly little uh, uh, horse arms here uh, that don't really work too well. The only thing that works on me is my mouth. Well, your mouth works enough to make up for it. Let me tell you, let, why don't you let me hold your pen for you? Hey, no, give it back, give it back, give, 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 give back my pen. Oh, okay, Festus. Boy, you need to have more trust. How could I rust? Only things made out of metal rust, like old cars and tractors and hammers and screwdrivers and old farmers left out in the rain. No, no, Festus, not rust, trust. You need to trust more. Why would I want to eat crust, nasty crust? They make my fur curly. No self-respecting horse wants curly hair. I'd look all crazy. I look worse than, than, than Pastor Justin it, it, with his crazy hair. Uh, Festus, I said trust. T trust with a T. I don't want to be trust. I saw them do that at a rodeo once. They tied his poor cow and they said they had to trust it like a turkey. No, thank you. Horses don't like to be tied up. It reminds me of back in the dark ages before Sesame Street when horses were discriminated against and puppets were done poorly. Back then, anyone with hairy ears or pointy teeth got tied up and done away with. Come to think of it, half of those people out there would be in big trouble as well. No, no tying me up, thank you. Sometimes you're a silly goose, Festus. I mean trust. T-R-U-S-T. Trust? What's that? Trust is when you are confident that someone is honest, like me, or when you depend on someone to keep their word or believe that they will do what they say when you have faith in someone. Well, why didn't you say so? Right at the beginning, we could have saved a lot of time. I know someone who trusted. Abraham trusted God. God said to Abraham he had to move house and go and live in another country. Even though he was old, he believed God. When God said he would give him children, Abraham trusted God. How do I know I can trust you? Have I ever lied to you? Nope. Do I keep my promise unless something makes it impossible? I suppose. Is there anything to stop me giving back your pen and keeping my word? Uh, only an earthquake or a twister or a flash flood. I suppose I can trust you. All right, you can hang on to my pen for me. Thanks. I won't let you down. Hey, God didn't let Abraham down either. I guess that's how Abraham knew he could trust God. God keeps his promises, and nothing stops God from doing what he wants. That's what my song is about. About trusting God. Yep, we know we can trust God because he keeps his promises. We should all trust God and do what he says. God keeps his promises, and we should trust him. He is our God. That sounds like a good song. Why don't you come out 
and teach me the song too. Then we can sing it together later. I can do that for you there, Flash. Thank you, Festus. And I'll hold on to your pen in the meantime. I really appreciate that. Boys and girls, remember, you can trust God with all your needs. Hope you have a wonderful week. God bless you and see you next time. Bye, bye. Good morning and welcome out to our Sunday School at Mountaineer Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Galatians this morning. Um, as you get flipped over there and get tuned in, we, we are thankful that you could decide to tune in and to be with us this morning. Uh, we'll go over some announcements before we get started this morning. Don't forget, tonight at 7, good Lord will, we'll be at the church tonight for evening worship. Um, and that is depending on the power situation. The, I made an announcement earlier this week, the power will be turned off in the community till 6. Um, if it's back on by 6, we will be in God's house at 7. Uh, bring your Sunday school quarterlies with you. Um, if you have them, because we'll be going through our Sunday school lesson this evening. And then Wednesday, we'll be back online for Wednesday evening service. And Sunday morning at 10.30 will be Sunday morning service online as well. Um, be much in prayer for our community. We have quite a few COVID cases popping up right now. And I believe we're going to have quite a few more, more than likely, in the coming weeks. So be much in prayer. Uh, the Lord will take care of those folks. and. He'll have his hand of protection and mercy upon our community. Uh, let's pray for all our school kids, staff and personnel in our schools for safety, hospital workers, first responders, and all those that are out um, being a possible risk of exposure. Pray for all them. Pray for all the folks that are quarantined. Lord, we'll bless them with, uh, with negative results. That way they can uh, give a clear bill of health and be able to go back to, to doing what they do. And uh, let's, let's just really be in prayer for everybody. Really be in prayer for our churches, area churches and things. Lord, give them safety. So let's bow our heads and let us pray. Most kind, gracious, heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to be in your house this morning, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to present your word by way of technology, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for using it as a blessing. And we pray, Lord, that through it we may bring glory to your name. We pray, Lord, especially for the unsaved this morning, Lord, that your spirit would touch them, Lord, and take away their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Lord, we pray, Lord, for um, our area churches, that you give them safety, watch over them, Lord. We pray, for Lord, for those that are sick and on the bed of affliction. We pray, Lord, you would bless them and heal them. We pray for the caretakers, Lord. Uh, we pray especially this morning, Lord, for those that are um, severely ill. We pray for uh, Sister Sabrina, that you would heal her, Lord, and, and take care of her. We pray, Lord, for all those in our community, Lord, that stand in need. Pray your blessing upon them, Lord. Pray for our leaders, Lord, that you give them the guidance they stand in need of, Lord, and that they would turn to you, Lord, and, and look to you for wisdom. We pray, Lord, you bless our services this morning, Lord. Give us the ability to teach your word, Lord, in spirit and truth. We love you and we praise you this morning. And in Jesus' name we pray. And amen. All right, we're going to be in the book of Galatians chapter 3, and in verse, starting in verse 19 this morning. We'll be finishing up the book of Galatians chapter 3. Um, and what we are looking at, we've been looking at over the last several weeks, this letter to the Church of Galatia. And in the letter, they, the Church of Galatia basically was wanting to add works to the gospel. Um, remember, that's still being done today quite a bit. People will believe that they're saved by grace. They're okay with that. They receive something they don't deserve. They're like, yeah, I got something great, amazing grace. I'll sweep the sound. But then they want to start saying, well, i got to do this, 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 and this to keep God's approval. Um, and they start making it a me-centered faith and not a God-centered faith, not a Christ-centered faith. Uh, and then we have to be very careful about that because when we are making our salvation in any way about us, we are elevating ourselves to the place of God. And we're making ourselves an item of worship. We're literally making false idols out of ourselves when God should be the center of of all of our worship. So let's start in Galatians 3.19. We'll, we'll be looking through verse 29 this morning. We'll simply go verse by verse and expound upon what the Bible has to say this morning and, and see what God has for us in his word. So Galatians 3 and 19, begin looking at the purpose of the law. And the word says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgression, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So what God is saying here is the law does have a purpose. 
It's not like Jesus came on the scene, the law is void at that point. It has no purpose. The law goes on forever. Now, the law was added because of transgression. Now, here's the thing. Without the law, we do not have sin. Law, the law shows us the law of God. Now, the law of God, as the word is said here, is not like the covenant with Abraham. The covenant of Abraham was given directly, directly from God to Abraham. The law was given from God to Moses, who is the mediator spoken of here, unto the people. But again, it was added because of transgression. You see, the law shows us where we sin and fall short of the glory of God. You see, the law, without the law, there would be no transgression. Let's think of our own civil law in America today. If there was no law in America, there would be no crime. You may be saying, people still do bad stuff. You're right. But it wouldn't be illegal. There's no laws. There's no crime. If there was no law, man may still do bad things, but it wouldn't be sin because there's no law against it. You see, salvation is not becoming good. To clarify that. Because the, the idea we have of what is good is based on society's standards of what is good. Now, I'm going to make this get a little deeper here, but try to follow me. If what is good is based in our mind on society's standard, then every single society would have a different standard. Now, that's true. For example, cuss words. I don't know if you know this or not about cuss words. Do you know that if you go to Africa and use an English cuss word, unless they know English, it really doesn't mean anything there. They don't care. Because it has no meaning. They don't know the purpose of that word. In their society, that word is not bad. They have their own cuss words. And now, that may seem crazy to you, but it does. Every society has its own cuss words. So when we change society, what is culturally good changes. This is why there is a generational gap in the church today. Because sometimes we are teaching so much cultural morality to our kids, we're missing biblical morality with our kids. Our kids don't understand why the things that society says is okay and it's not bad. They go into a church and the church tells them it's bad and, and their view is, well, that's just an old-timey way when it's not an old-timey way, it's a biblical way. And the Bible is eternal. It's not for a period of time. It is forever. Same as dress. Listen, modesty went out the window years ago, unfortunately. But society accepts that. They think people should be able to dress however they want, and society should just accept that. But the Bible says to be modest. For men to dress as men and women to dress as women. Now that ain't, that's not culturally acceptable today. But we as, a, as, as the church of the living God should not be concerned with cultural acceptability and be concerned with what God finds acceptable. See, that's where we've messed up in westernized Christianity. We've become so seeker sensitive. We are so concerned with trying to get the church to think that we are 
um, looking to entice people just to get, get them in the building. And I would love for our church to be plumb full of people. But if that means I have to um, give up something that the Bible says, it's not, it's not going to happen. It's not worth it. God did not call us to be politically correct and acceptable. God called us to be a lighthouse on a hill. To be the salt of the world. That we may be a testimony. Be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. But yet we have made our faith too often about being culturally good. And it's got nothing to do with that. Our faith is about a Savior. And the law shows us where we have transgressed the law of God. The law of God. Not the standard, the law of God. So you see, it's not good or bad. It's guilty or not guilty. That's how we need to view it. And the Bible shows us that we have all sinned and fell short of the glory of God. And because of that, we all stand guilty. Every man, woman, and child stands guilty. That's why I will never stand up here and preach down to anyone. Because I am just as guilty as the most wretched person in the world because I have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. Paul said he is the chief among sinners. And I view myself the same way. I have no right to tell you, thus saith Pastor Justin, that God's word, because it is God speaking, not me, God speaking, has the right to speak down to you. Because God is high and lifted up. He is sinless. He has the authority. Verse 20 and 21 says, Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but is but God is one. Is the law then against the promise of God? God forbid. For there had been a law given which could have given life. Verily righteousness should have been by the law. So what we are seeing is there is a difference between law and, and, and promises or covenant. And when we look at this, it might imply that they are opposed or against each other. But we see that they go together. Because salvation, righteousness, does not come by the law. But the law shows our lack of righteousness. The law shows us our need for salvation. And because of that, we lean on the promises of God. The promise that if we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we will receive salvation and we'll receive righteousness. You see, it's not by any works that we earn our promise. But the promise is given to us absent of our works. Again, I have heard the false gospel preached until I, 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 it really just makes me sick to hear it. About all the things one must do to be saved. But yet when Jesus was on the cross. As he gave up the ghost. He says it is finished. He didn't say it has started. He didn't say now it's yours. It is finished. In the Latin it means paid in full. When Jesus died, he paid for your sins completely to the uttermost. There is nothing left to your sin debt once you have placed your faith in Christ. So why are you trying to work to earn his favor this morning? Maybe some of you listening are trying to work to earn your salvation this morning. Do you know that if you are doing 
are trying to do good works to earn your salvation with God, that is just as sinful as the prostitute, the drunkard, and the drug addict on the corner. It's true because you are literally robbing God of his rightful glory of being the only one that can provide salvation by trying to provide your own. Now that doesn't mean doing good works is bad. But we do not do good works to earn our righteousness. We do good works because God is driving us to do good works by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We do good works to bring glory into his name and to bring our neighbor into, and, into faith in Jesus Christ. It has got nothing to do with earning favor. Nothing. Verse 22 says, But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up into the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us into Christ that we might be justified. Now we need a little bit of a history lesson for those uh, three verses there to make sense. In the days of, of Hebrews, they had what was a schoolmaster or a family slave. Now, what this individual would do is they would take a young boy back and forth from school. And they would oversee his conduct while he was at school to make sure he was a good little boy. The law is our schoolmaster in that it shows us how to be good. But here's the problem with this schoolmaster. The problem with this schoolmaster is that we cannot be good. It can't happen. There's people who look at the Ten Commandments and, and, and they try their best to live them every day of their life. But yet they find themselves failing again and again and again. And what people will do a lot of times is they'll justify their sin. They'll say, well, I didn't tell a lie, I told a joke. Well, it says a little white lie. It's not a bad lie. But that's like looking at a cop and, a, and who has pulled you over in a 35 mile per hour zone and said, Sir, I was going, I was just going 40, not 45. That may very well be true, but it's not how much you broke the law. It's that you broke the law. It's not how well do you keep the law. It's do you keep the law? And if the Bible is true, and I know that it is, no one but Jesus Christ has ever came and kept the law. He's the only living being ever to keep the law of God at any point in the flesh. I don't care how long you've been saved. You are not keeping every dot and every T of the law. Only Jesus. Jesus did not, the Bible says, did not come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law. Because if we were to receive salvation from this man, someone had to keep the law to be the sacrificial lamb for mankind. And the only one who has ever successfully done that is Jesus Christ. You see, because our schoolmaster, because our tutor has showed us that we can't be good boys and girls. We see the fault in ourselves. We truly should see the true depth of our depravity. That the word says that we can't even seek God unless he first seeks us. What does that mean? That means Mamaw may tell you that you need Jesus. But if we want to be really honest, it doesn't mean much to us until Jesus reveals that we need him through the working of the Holy Spirit. Because you may walk to an altar to impress mom and dad, but that's not salvation. 
I guess getting an extra cup of ice cream at the dinner table will kind of reward you. Salvation only comes when the need for salvation has been revealed by the preaching of the law and the gospel and the Holy Spirit revealing to us the true need we have for a supernatural forgiveness that can only be received through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary and by us placing our faith and trust in him. Our puppet this morning spoke to us about trust. And the only way to receive right standing with God is to fully trust in Jesus Christ for our salvation. You see, the law, without the law showing us our need for Christ, we would never come to Christ. And we would never be justified in the sight of God. Verse 25 says, But after that, faith has come, and we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now, here's the thing that a lot of people mess up. They think they've come to faith, they've received Christ, now I've got to keep that law. But they're not looking at the Bible in context. They're not looking at Scripture in purpose. After we come to faith, see what would happen in the Hebrew days is once they reach a certain age of maturity, they were no longer under the schoolmaster because they could, they, could, they could be good on their own. They knew what was good and they would do it. Once we have come to faith, we receive the Holy Spirit and the schoolmaster is no longer needed because the Holy Spirit shows us right from wrong. It convicts us, not condemns us. It convicts us because there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit conviction shows the born again believer what he should do and what he should not do. Not for salvation, but because just as a child, God wants what's best for his children because he loves us. And that way we can live for our purpose, which is to disciple others and bring glory unto the name of the Father. Verse 26, for you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, that word there, children, is a showing of maturity. You see, once someone, again, once there's no longer in the schoolmaster, they had reached in Maturity, And that word there means full-grown adult is what it's speaking of. You see, we ought to operate in a certain level of maturity because God has revealed to us the truth by the working of the Holy Spirit and the learning of His Word. The Bible says to study to show thyself approved. You want to really find out how well you're doing? You get into God's Word. It'll either convict you or condemn you. If it condemns you, you need to get saved. If it convicts, you need to repent and do better. Either way, it's not a walk down the aisle and then you're done. That's another false gospel being preached around the world today. That brother so and so walked the aisle 40 years ago and has laid in a bar for the last 40 years. But praise God, he walked the aisle. That's not what the Bible bears out. The Bible bears out that his spiritual journey is continual. It's not a vaccination that we take a shot and we are good. But it is a continual walk with Christ. Not because the continual walk is what makes us saved. It's because since God has saved me, the idea of doing anything besides walking with him is unimaginable to me. Does that mean sinless? Oh, of course not. I sin daily and I repent daily. But what it does mean is God is constantly revealing to me the fault of my and my failures, and I'm constantly trying to repent and do better on a daily basis. And there's times that I'm not real proud of myself. There's times that I, 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 I feel like I do better than others. But it is a journey that we are on. And it is a journey that doesn't end. Verse 27 says, For as many as you have been baptized into Christ, 
have put on Christ. And what this is speaking of in the ancient terms, to put on someone is standing or, or taking the position of another person. So think of it as this. When Jesus went to the cross and we place our faith in Christ, what happens is Christ literally takes our place and we take his place. That's how we become sons and daughters of God. Because Christ is taking my judgment. He's taking my punishment. He's taking my penalty for my sins. And I'm taking his place as a son of God and becoming co-heirs with Christ. That couldn't happen unless I be in Christ. So literally we are switching where the, the theological term substitutionary atonement comes from. Because he is substituting for me in that he is paying the penalty for my sins that I may receive his righteousness. Verse 28 and 29 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ... That are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise? You know, here's the thing about putting on Christ and becoming sons of God. We all become one. You see that it says there's no Jew, no Greek, there's no, there's no ethnic standard. So I don't know about, if you understand this or not, but there, there's not going to be racism in heaven. Ain't going to happen. And I don't think you can be a Christian and be a racist. Well, I know you can't. I'm not going to say think. I know you can't. Because the Bible says we are to love everyone. That means regardless of race, regardless of ethnic background, we love one another. That means in the church, every race, every ethnic background, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Period. And if you can't worship with a brother or sister that has a different race or different ethnicity, then you have a very serious spiritual problem that you need to make right with God. If you view that someone of a different race or different ethnic background uh, is inferior or doesn't have the same value as you, then you have a very serious sin problem that you need to get right with God. And you need to repent of that. Because the Bible says in Christ Jesus, regardless of ethnic or racial background, we are all one in Christ. I also show there's no social uh, difference, bond or free. You know, a lot of times people say, well, there are lower rungs of the social ladder, upper rungs of the social ladder. You've got rich church, poor church. That's not God's design. God's design is when we are in Christ, regardless of where we are on the social ladder, regardless of what our bank account, 401k or IRA shows, regardless whether we drive a Chevette or a Corvette, we are all one in Christ. So it shouldn't make a difference. Shouldn't make a difference. There's no sexual difference, male or female. God does not care if you are a boy or a girl. He loves you the same. So there is no room for sexism and bigotry in God's church. And if you can't understand or wrap your mind around all that, or you think that I may be... Uh, 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 giving you some sort of false ideology, look at your own children. I have a son, I have a daughter. They are equally loved in my eyes. I don't think of this, well, this is my female child, this is my male child, and I love them differently. No, I love them equally, equally. And it's the same thing in, 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 if, if one grows up and, and is rich and one grows up and is poor, that will not change how much I love them because they are my children. You see, when you love your kids, you look past all that that's meaningless to you. 
Same thing with, with, with race and ethnicity. I have some great friends who have adopted children into their home that needed a parent that are of different ethnic and racial backgrounds, and it, it does not change the way they love them. It's not their child of one race and this child of another race. It is their children, and they love them because they belong to them. Well, God sees us that way. Because we are His, He loves us regardless of these differences that we have made in our worldly minds. God treats us equally because we are his children adopted into the family. Now here is the sobering fact to all of this. Judgment is also equal. God does not care if you're rich or poor. God doesn't care if you donate to the church. God doesn't care if you attended daily. If you're unsaved and you face God in judgment, you'll be condemned to the same hell as every other unregenerate, unborn again, unsaved individual. Because when you appear in front of God, he's going to say, I never knew you. I had no relationship with you is what he's saying. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And the reality is we all deserve that. But what the believer will hear is enter in thy good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you a ruler over many. And the reason he will hear that is not based on what he did while he is on earth, not based on the life that he lived, or not based on his church membership. It is based on the fact that he placed his faith in Jesus Christ and he became justified in the sight of God, spiritually born again and regenerated. So he, he received Christ's righteousness and his sins went to the cross and was paid for there. I am not going to heaven because I am a good person. I am not going to heaven because I do good works, because my bad will always outweigh my good, long as I'm in the flesh. I strive to live the best life I can live to bring glory to my Father. My morning prayer every morning is, Lord, let my life today bring glory unto you. Some days it does more than others. But it's not what gets me into heaven. Because it, my, I, I stand condemned in myself. But because I am in Christ Jesus and no longer in myself, Jesus took the penalty and I receive the salvation. You can have that this morning. If you're listening and you're unsaved or you're unsure of your salvation, I'd be terrified to be unsure of my salvation. You need to know where you're going when you leave this world because we're all leaving. I hate to break it to you. There ain't nobody going to hold on to this. Uh, used to be an old song. Ain't no one getting out of this world alive. And that's a fact. You're either going to go in the rapture or you're going to go by death. Either way, you're going to go. The question is this morning, where are you going to go? You have a decision to make. When I pull out of the holler here, I can turn right and go to Logan, turn left and go to Chattanooga. I make a decision. You have a decision to make this morning. Are you going to reject Jesus yet again? Go about your way, playing uh, gambling with your eternal destination? Or will you simply make a decision of faith to accept the free gift of salvation by trusting in, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for your salvation and calling on God in a moment of faith and asking Him to save you. you say, Pastor, I don't know what to say. Listen, you talk to Him as a small child talking to His Father because that's really how the role we are. But you speak to Him with the reverence of a man who's drowning in a lake begging for a life preserver because that's the urgency that we have. Saying, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Lord, I know I'm in need of a Savior. Lord, I trust your Son, Jesus Christ, and His death 
that paid the price for me. Lord, please forgive me. Lord, please save me. And welcome me into your family. A prayer such as that is enough to change your eternal destination. Again, it is not the prayer or the words that saves you. It's the faith in Jesus Christ that drives you to pray that prayer that saves you. A man that prays a prayer that doesn't have faith in Christ is, is a waste of time. It means nothing. But if your faith truly rests in Christ, a prayer of faith, again, will change from, heaven, change from hell to heaven in a moment, instantly. So as we pray in closing this morning, I encourage you, if you've never been born again, place your faith in Jesus Christ this morning and call out to God to be saved. Let us pray. Most kind, gracious, heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to present your word this morning, Lord. We pray, Lord, now that your Holy Spirit use our feeble attempts to touch the hearts of people and bring them under a Holy Spirit power and conviction that they place their faith in your Son and be saved and born again. We thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you, Lord, for giving us salvation. Thank you for our church here, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for safety for our people. Bless our little community, Lord, and drive this virus out of our land. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have prayed the prayer of salvation this morning, we encourage you to send us a message or, 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 or text us, call us. We'd love to talk to you about your next steps in your spiritual journey. Uh, don't forget, we'll be back here at the church tonight at 7 for evening worship. Uh, we encourage you to come out and be with us. Make sure when you do come, you wear your mask. Masks are required while you're inside the building. Um, also, if you don't feel comfortable coming out just yet, the messages will also be online on YouTube and Facebook. And we encourage you to tune in there and let people know uh, they may not realize that we have services online. They're not able to get out. We love to give them an opportunity to hear God's word um, on a regular basis. So we love you. God bless you. And we'll see you this evening.